welcome to the Human Flourishing Project. I'm your host, Alex Epstein. We were off last week. Hopefully you missed the show. This week, there's a topic I'm really, really excited about. And to introduce it, I'll just say that at this point in my life, so let's see, I'm about 38 and three quarters years old. I guess 38, it's, it's about to be June 1st, so 38 and five sixths or 10 twelfths. I would say the if I could only recommend one book that captured what I think is most important for every individual to know about human flourishing, it would be the book that I'm going to discuss today and probably on a bunch of subsequent episodes. And to introduce the title of the book, today's episode is entitled The Wisdom of the Fountainhead, Part 1. The Wisdom of the Fountainhead, Part 1. Now, if you're listening to this show and you're familiar with me, there's a good chance that you're familiar with Ayn Rand, the author and philosopher, the novelist and philosopher. And if you're familiar with her, you're certainly familiar with The Fountainhead, which is one of her two famous, very philosophical novels, along with Atlas Shrugged. So it's probably no surprise that I recommend this. But actually, a month ago, if you'd asked me, what's the most valuable book for human flourishing? I, I wouldn't have as clearly thought The Fountainhead. It would be it would be up there, but I wouldn't have thought it uh, as de- as definitely as I do now. And a big part of the reason is, for that is that I recently reread The Fountainhead. I actually mostly re-listened to it on Audible, and I had not read it in probably five years, maybe maybe even more than five years. I had read Atlas Shrugged more recently, and I've read Atlas Shrugged many more times than I've read. The Fountainhead is the first thing by Ayn Rand that I read, or the first long thing by Ayn Rand that I read. And it's just so philosophical and has such a fascinating analysis of the culture that it's just always relevant to my work and to my thinking, whereas The Fountainhead is more about the individual's life and uh, hasn't always seemed as urgent to reread. And I felt like I'd internalized it pretty well. But recently I decided to reread or re-listen to The Fountainhead, and I think that It really struck me differently this time, and at least in a substantial way, much more substantial than I had thought. And I think one thing that's notable about it is that since the last time I read The Fountainhead, I have become much more conventionally successful. So I've become much more successful in the conventional sense of making more money and having more notoriety, having more interest in my work having more impact. And having had the experience of that and reading The Fountainhead, really, it it affects me in a different way. And I actually want to start off by reading a quote by Steve Jobs that addresses in a small way what I think The Fountainhead addresses in a substantial way. And it was an interview he did about the management thinker named Joseph Duran, who was a very influential thinker on management who influenced the Japanese very positively. Really fascinating guy. The guy lived to either 107 or 108, and he was married to his wife, I think, for 80 or 84 years. And I think she lived to either 104 or 108. So just unbelievable longevity to this guy. And he worked very late in life. And so Steve Jobs says, I think most people, and he's referring to Duran here, I think most people that are able to make a sustained contribution over time rather than just a peak are very internally driven. You have to be. Because in the ebb and tide of people's opinions and of fads, there are going to be times when you are criticized and criticism is very difficult. And so when you're criticized, you learn to pull back a little and listen to your own drummer. And to some extent, that isolates you from the praise if you eventually get it too. The praise becomes a little less important to you and the criticism becomes a little less important to you in the same measure. And you become more internally driven. Now, I found this fascinating both because of Duran, but also because Steve Jobs, I think, is talking about himself. I mean, he's somebody who you know, made a, who did incredible productive work from a very early age and had lots of existential success and also lots of criticism and and reading not too much between the lines here, I take it as he's saying that he probably earlier on 
felt more gratification when he got praise. And then at a certain point, he became much more focused on whether he was living up to his own standards. And I'm, I'm interpreting here, but I, I'm pretty sure this is true. And the satisfaction he got from the, the creative work that he was doing. And, and having listened to just about all of his publicly inter- available interviews, it comes across really strongly with Jobs, particularly later on in his career, how internally driven he is in, in terms of he wants to make products that he thinks are great, and he loves the process of working on them. He loves the process of collaborating with really, really smart people, and that's his focus. And I remember when, um, in an interview that Johnny Johnny Ive did with Vanity Fair, he had a couple of really in, uh, interesting comments about Steve Jobs, but one was that Steve Jobs had just a very simple motivation and how he talked about how Steve Jobs had no grand plan, you know, to change the world. It was that he just really, really wanted to make great products. And then, of course, that had, as a byproduct, this incredible impact. But it was this this very internal kind of focus. Now, my, my own experience with this issue of internal motivation has been interesting because I would describe myself as a lifelong ambitious person, and that has had pros and cons to it. So ambitious as in, from a young age, I had the idea that I'm going to do something big. I'm going to do something great. But definitely part of that motivation, I hope not all of it from the beginning, but definitely part of it was what Jobs would call external and what the Fountainhead would call second-handed, which means that it's it's really focused on others, particularly the approval the the relationship of what I'm doing to others, both that they approve of it and also the superiority of it. Because when you talk about something being great, there's a, there that can easily become primarily, it doesn't need to be, but it can easily become comparative in the sense of I'm focused on, I'm going to be better than other people and or I'm going to be someone that other people think of in a certain way. And I think this is a, a pitfall that often goes along with ambition because ambition is a is this general idea to do a lot, but it can easily mix together to do a lot in terms of, as what Ayn Rand would call a creator. So somebody who has his own standards of what he wants to create and, and loves a particular process of creation and just wants to focus on that. And then things like approval and even impact on the world are very much a byproduct of that. But versus the second hander whose primary focus is I'm going to do something big in the world. I don't know what it is. And and it's not because I want to create any specific thing because I have my own specific standards and my own specific love of certain kinds of, of activities and certain values. It's because I want to stand in a certain relationship to other people, um, in the world. And that's that's something that is you know we it's this is really what Ayn Rand is calling second-handedness is is really praised in the world today. You hear there's a focus on I want to change the world and everyone's focused on, you know, changing the world. That's that should be your goal in life. You, know, you want to change the world. And that is very often status-based because it's what does it mean I want to change the world? It means I want I want to be the person who changes the world. I want the world to change in a certain way in relation to me. And often people, and because of me. And it, it's not that, hey, I want to create something really valuable, like in the Fountainhead of Howard Work. Like, I want to create, I want to create a certain kind of building. And I, I love doing that. And I believe that that's valuable. And I have my own standards and approach. And I just, that's the kind of work I want to do. And then, yeah, if I do it well, there will be people who value it. And yes, I hope that they benefit from it. And I hope it influences a lot of people, but his, his, it's a very selfish focus in the healthiest sense where he's focused on his own creativity and his own satisfaction. And he's not at all primarily focused on, oh, everybody else has to change. Nobody else is, you know, no other way of building should exist, or even I have to have X percent of the buildings changed, he would regard that as that's a waste of my life because then I'm just, I'm just living through others. I'm just obsessed with what's going on with them. 
and then I can't focus on me and I can't actually do my productive thing. And that ultimately won't do them any good, but it certainly won't do me any good. But yet change the world, have an impact. All of these things are just viewed as ends in themselves. Like you're, that, that should be your goal in life. And part of that, you know, part of the appeal of that is, well, if you change the world, then maybe you'll get money and you'll certainly get status. You'll get approval. And isn't that, uh, satisfying. And then sometimes people will say, well, you're doing something not for yourself and that'll be satisfying. And my own experience, having had a relatively speaking, a significant impact and having different kinds of reactions, including a lot of praise is what Steve Jobs says. And certainly what Howard Rourke is experiencing is just, just completely maps to my own experience, which is that if I look at what parts of my life I'm unequivocally happy with and satisfied with. And I feel like, oh, that there, I was really living the way I want to live there. I'm really happy. It's really connected to doing things that I, that I really love to do. uh, And that in a very personal way to me, and it's not the most meaningful things are not somebody says that I affected them. And when it is, it's, it's, that's meaningful when they're, when they're really connecting to what I, love about what I'm creating. But in terms of, you know, somebody says, oh, you're the smartest guy, or even somebody says you're the dumbest guy, just over time, that just becomes less and less interesting and and satisfying. And I was having a conversation recently with some younger people and talking about career. And I really felt the need to emphasize that whatever you're thinking about in your career, the thing that's going to matter most is, are you going are you really satisfied with what you're doing internally? Do you Are you creating something that you believe in that's in accordance with your own standards where you love the process of doing that? And if you can do that and you're, real, and, and you've, you're thinking about it in a rational way, that's going to be valuable to other people and it's going to help you have all kinds of positive relationships with other people, but you're going to really feel like you're living. And I believe that if, if it's all about approval and status and these other things, it's all about other people. That is, that is just, I don't have the right analogy off the top of my head, but that is going to be hollow. And I just, I've seen it over and over and I've, I've seen it with myself. And so far as those motivations have, have driven me, I've seen, yeah, those are not satisfying motivations. That is not part of human flourishing. So when I'm reading The Fountainhead this time, I'm really seeing it from the perspective of oh, what is it like Howard Rourke is the ultimate creator. He's got the ultimate level of internal motivation, firsthand motivation. And it, it's been fascinating. I mean, I already read it through once or listened through it once. And now I'm doing it again right after because I've, I've just felt like, oh, this is he really has the secret. Like he, this guy, this character that Ayn Rand created, he really has the secret of life in terms of enjoying life. Because I think that creativity, your own creativity is the heart of your enjoyment of life. And the way that he approaches it and experience it, experiences it is so, it's so well done in the sense that it's so, it's so pure, but in a way that is, I believe, emulatable by all of us. I believe that that everyone can have this kind of motivation. Now, Rourke is an architectural genius, but I think the way that he, his kind of motivation and the satisfaction he gets from it, I believe is something that anyone can develop. Now, it might take a while to overcome certain other things, but not only in the book is Rourke's approach shown to be the one that really leads to the flourishing life, but Everything I've seen in life shows that me that that is that he's really right about that. And of course, Ayn Rand is right about that through him. But I want to I want to focus on him because he's this you know he's drawn out very specifically in the book in a certain way. So I thought that today I, I'm thinking of doing a series of episodes on this topic, and I'm interested what listeners think of. But what I thought I would do today is just talk about one scene in The Fountainhead from this perspective of Rourke's motivation. And it's not the most famous scene in the book at all, but just in this one scene, there's so much. It's it's so pregnant, and I find it it's so inspiring, both in terms of the way that I want to be in my own life 
and also inspiring to avoid certain kinds of things. And I'm going to explain the scene in a way that even if you haven't read the book, it, it should make a, a good deal of sense to you, although I highly recommend the book. And, and let's just say, if, if, if I do it next week, which I, I'm planning on it, just read the first five chapters of the book, because I'll, I'll plan on talking about stuff that occurs in those five chapters. So the, the scene I'm talking about is Howard Rourke's first conversation with Mrs. Keating. Mrs. Keating. So Mrs. Keating, Louisa Keating, is the mother of Peter Keating, and Peter Keating is the star student at the school, the Stanton Institute of Technology, which is a school where he is just about to graduate with highest honors. He's the valedictorian, Peter Keating is, and he is good-looking, and he has definitely the highest status of anyone there, and Mrs. Keating is his mother who's scrimped and saved and done all sorts of things to put Peter Keating in the highest possible position in the field of of architecture. So Peter Keating is definitely the pinnacle at this, you know, the at least possible pinnacle at this stage in his life of status in the field of architecture. Now, Howard Rourke is a year, I think two years younger and a year behind Peter Keating, and he happens to board in Mrs. Keating's house. That's one of the, you know, that's one of the the things that she's willing to do and to, you know, take a boarder into the house. And so, so he, so they can get his rent. And Howard Rourke is an aspiring architect, but by the standards of the school, he's a failure. He has just gotten expelled from the Stanton Institute of Technology, just as Peter Keating is getting highest honors, including an offer from the leading agricultural, uh, architectural firm, uh, Francon and Heyer, and also a, uh, he can choose between that and then a prestigious scholarship to a, a place and in, in a four-year scholarship to an architectural school in France, whereas Howard Rourke is, has just been thrown out of school. But Howard Rourke, it, he has something distinctive that you get very early on. He has his own conception of architecture. And if you wanted to liken him to somebody in real life, if you're at all familiar with architects, it would definitely be Frank Lloyd Wright, although his his psychology is not at all modeled on Frank Lloyd Wright, according to Ayn Rand. Uh, but you, there's this idea that certain architects have, including Frank Lloyd Wright, that the form of a building must follow its function. And that's certainly, I mean, Rourke has a much more involved view of that, but certainly that is something that stands out. So he has a, vi- a conception of architecture where the form of of the building and all of its details must follow the function, and that includes you know, who the tenant is, but also where it is, what materials are available, and what he completely disagrees with is the practice of following the forms of the past. So in, in a later passage of the book, he'll talk about why he's criticizing the Parthenon, and he'll talk about how some of the structures in the Parthenon were emulating in marble things that were necessary in wood. So certain forms were necessary because of the limitations of wood, and yet people just copied them in marble. And for him, for his own conception of architecture, this is sacrilege. So Rourke Rourke loves solving architectural problems, but in his own way. He has his own independent ideas about architecture, what its purpose is, how it should be done, how it shouldn't be done. He's thought about those independently. He's presumably open to revising his thinking if somebody can offer him an argument, but he has a lot of confidence in his thinking because it is his thinking, and he's decided that what he wants to do in life is to build. Now, he the context is he was at the Stanton Institute of Technology because primarily because he wanted to learn about architecture, but specifically he wanted to learn about the engineering aspects of architecture and building, including mathematics. And at this point, you get vaguely the idea that will become clear later, clear in the book that he he feels like I had stayed at this school uh, a little bit too long. And you definitely get the the idea that he's not too unhappy about being expelled because the school was focused on the forms of the past, and he believes that's wrong. He's independently concluded that's wrong. So that's a bunch of buildup, but hopefully it helps just grasp what I'm going to focus on in this scene. So you have Howard Rourke walks 
he's there's been a scene with him where he's going to his a place where he rejuvenates and he's going there for the last time because he knows he's going to leave Stanton because he's just been expelled and he has to move on. And Mrs. Keating tries to she she Rourke makes her uneasy and she's definitely rooting for Peter Keating and feels some sort of threat from Rourke, but she doesn't quite understand what. And so she's trying to pretend that she's upset about him being expelled and it's not working very well. So here's here's what be, how it begins. This is Mrs. Keating. I'm so sorry about about what happened this morning. And Rourke's response is, what? Uh, so this just, this is just, so this is the context of, he has just been expelled basically from the most prestigious architectural school. But what he's been doing is he's been thinking about, okay, how am I going to move? I need to move forward with my career. I really, I was staying here too long anyway. Like for him, it has, it has no emotional significance that he was just expelled, except that he feels like, yeah, I actually should have left earlier because I'd already learned what I could learn in terms of engineering. And they were trying to get me to do all of this bogus architecture from the past. So it just, it just makes me laugh to to think of him just saying he, it's not even the way he's looking at the world in terms of what he wants to create. Like there's nothing to be sorry about. It's not on his mind as a, as a negative thing. Whereas for Mrs. Keating, as we'll see, who's totally focused on status and greatness. That's the only thing that could be in your mind. If you were expelled from a prestigious school, I mean, what, what else could occupy your mind for a long time? And then she, she says, of course, you'll have to give up the architect profession now, won't you? But then a young man can always earn a decent living clerking or selling or something. And so this is, uh, I'll give Rourke's reaction in a second, but you could just see, okay, she's she has a lot of hostility uh, toward him and, and she's being very mean, but trying to be nice. Like, of course, you'll have to give up the architect profession now. So one aspect of this is, but she thinks, well, you've lost status. You've, you were at this school, this prestigious, this prestigious school. That's how you become an architect. And you just got, you got an F, you got expelled. So of course you can't pursue architecture. Whereas Rourke's view is I can build and so I can pursue architecture because I can build and there's somebody who's going to want somebody who's really, really good at designing and building buildings that are actually really good for their lives. But then the other aspect that's going on with him is, you know, she's insulting him. And Rourke, think about Rourke. He, he is, just from what I've conveyed, he's somebody who believes very passionately in his own approach. And so he, he believes, I mean, he knows from his own perspective that he is infinitely better at architecture than his classmates because he's doing what he regards as real architecture and they're just basically copying the past. And yet after she says, but then a young man can always earn a decent living clerking or selling or something, the, the next line is just, he turned to go. And I just love this because it's just, he doesn't care about the insult. Because so, some people, and certainly when I was younger, you know, I would think about, I'm going to be independent. And that that really has a rebellion argument, to, rebellion component. Like I'm going to tell people that I don't care what they think, but that's, that of course gives something away. If you really don't care what they think, it's just, you just want to get, if, if it's not valuable, you just want to leave as quickly as possible. He has no goal of proving himself. He has no desire to convince her that he's good. He just wants to go live his life on his own terms. And then as he turns to go, she says, oh, Mr. Rourke, she called. Yes, the dean phoned for you while you were out. For once, she expected some emotion from him and an emotion would be the equivalent of seeing him broken. She did not know what it was about him that had always made her want to see him broken. Yes, he asked. The dean, she repeated uncertainly, trying to recapture her effect. The dean himself, through his secretary. Well, that's Rourke saying, well, this is com- completely uninterested. She said to tell you that the dean wanted to see you immediately the moment you got back. And Rourke just says, thank you. And Mrs. Keating says, what do you suppose he can want now? Rourke says, I don't know. And the author's description is, he had said, I don't know. She heard distinctly, I don't give a damn. She stared at him incredulously. So again, we have two totally different ways of seeing the world and and the status of people in the world. To Rourke, you can assume that given that the school is just in Rourke's view, not really teaching architecture. It's just teaching the history of architecture, but telling people to just repeat it blindly. So it's much worse than just teaching. It's infinitely worse than, than just teaching the history, which can have value as history. So he, you know, the dean in his mind is just 
oh, this is somebody who's part of this institution that is not giving me what I need. Whereas in Mrs. Keating's mind, this is a dean, right? He's a dean. I mean, that's a big deal, right? He's a big person in the world. But to work, work is just focused on himself as a creator. It just doesn't mean anything. And he doesn't have hostility. He's not mad at the dean. It's just the dean doesn't really exist to him in his world. And then she, she goes on. By the way, she said, PD is graduating today. She said it without apparent relevance apparent relevance today. Oh yes, that's work. And then Mrs. Keating says, it's a great day for me. When I think of how I skimped and slaved to put my boy through school, not that I'm complaining. I'm not one to complain. Petey's a brilliant boy. She stood drawn up. Her stout little body was corseted so tightly under the starched fold of her folds of her cotton dress that it seemed to squeeze the fat out to her wrists and ankles. But of course she went on rapidly with eagerness of her favorite subject. I'm not one to boast. Some mothers are lucky and others just aren't. We're all in our rightful place. You just watch Petey from now on. I'm not one to want my boy to kill himself with work, and I'll thank the Lord for any small success that comes his way. But if that boy isn't the greatest architect of, his, of this USA, his mother will want to know the reason why. And so Rourke's whole response to that, as described by the author, is just, he moved to go. So think about this, and imagine that you, you believe with total conviction that you are your conception of architecture makes sense and that the conventional one makes no sense and is wrong and then there's the 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 mother of peter keating is basically saying hey you should go become a salesman because you're worthless and Petey's a brilliant boy and you with every fiber in your body believe that's not true and in fact as we learn later Peter Keating will sometimes turn to Howard Rourke for help when he actually when he actually needs to do something besides copy a, some historical thing. If he needs to really make a plan that will be useful for the inhabitant of a house, he goes to Rourke. So Rourke knows full well, but and I can just imagine myself if I was in Rourke's position when I was younger to think like, oh, I'm gonna tell her off and I'm gonna I'm gonna explain why I'm great. And it's just no, he turned to go because he moved to go because Mrs. Keating and her opinions, they don't really exist to him because they're not they're not valuable to him. They're not part of his life. He's focused on, I want to live a certain kind of life I want to create. Uh, presumably, I want relationships, but I want, I want relationships with people that can really relate to me. If, if there's some blowhard who's just saying a bunch of nonsense, it just, it doesn't resonate with him. It's not real. Also notice with Mrs. Keating, that she's very focused on greatness. She talks about if that boy isn't the greatest ar architect of this USA. So notice, and you hear this a lot, like, oh, I want to be the greatest. And it's just total focus on other people. Wherever other people are, for whatever reason, I'm going to be above them. It's not that she doesn't say anything about, oh, Peter really loves architecture and he's passionate about it. And this building even was really meaningful to him or to me. And I love the No, it's just that, he is brilliant. You know, he, sh but what does that mean? I mean, he shines relative to the other people and then he's, he is the greatest and that's what she wants for him to be the greatest. Now here's the, the final scene, which is longer than the other ones I've read. So it's, it's describing his room and it talks about, he had brought nothing to the room, but his clothes and his drawings. There were few clothes and too many drawings. They were stacked high in one corner. Sometimes she thought the drawings lived here, lived there, not the man. Rourke walked now to these drawings. They were the first things to be packed. He lifted one of them, then the next, then another. He stood looking at the broad sheets. They were sketches of buildings such as had never stood on the face of the earth. They were as the first houses built by the first man born, who had never heard of others building before him. There was nothing to be said of them, except that each structure was inevitably what it had to be. It was not as if the draftsman had sat over them, pondering laboriously, piecing together doors, windows, and columns as his whim dictated and as the books prescribed. It was as if the buildings had sprung from the earth and from some living force, complete, unalterably right. The hand that had made the sharp pencil lines still had much to learn, but not a line seemed superfluous, not a needed plane was missing. The structures were austere and simple. 
until one looked at them and realized what work, what complexity of method, what tension of thought had achieved the simplicity. No laws had dictated a single detail. The buildings were not classical. They were not Gothic. They were not Renaissance. They were only Howard Rourke. So I'll stop at this point. You, you get some of what I've talked about before, although this is articulated much better than I did, but just that you get the sense of he's got his own approach. And it's it's not his own approach in the sense of what Ayn Rand would call subjectivism, where it's just, oh, he feels a certain way and he and he does it. Nor is it like there's some absolute law of architecture that everyone should just discover and follow and he's, you know, he's following it. It's not that either, which she would describe as, she calls that the intrinsicist view, just like there's there's one truth out there in reality and that then everyone just needs to discover. And this this applies to, this is a big subject, but it applies to, to value issues because like with physics issues, in a sense, there is. But it's it's that he is... You know, it's his own take, but it's it's his independent perception of reality and what a good building would be given, you know, given the nature of reality and, and given, again, given his own, his own particular thought process. So you get a sense of, okay, this is, this is what he's focused on. This is the work that he loves. And then you get it. He stopped looking at a sketch. It was one that had never satisfied him. So I'll continue. He had designed it as an exercise he had given himself apart from his schoolwork. He did that often when he found some particular site and stopped before it to think about, to think of what building it should bear. He had spent nights staring at this sketch, wondering what he had missed. Glancing at it now, unprepared, he saw the mistake he had made. He flung the sketch down on the table. He bent over it. He slashed lines straight through his neat drawing. He stopped once in a while and stood looking at it, his fingertips pressed to the paper, as if his hands held the building. His hands had long fingers, hard veins, prominent joints, and wrist bones. An hour later, he heard a knock at his door. Come in, he snapped, without stopping. Mr. Rourke, gasped Mrs. Keating, staring at him from the threshold. What on earth are you doing? He turned around, he turned and looked at her, trying to remember who she was. How about the dean, she moaned. The dean that's waiting for you. Oh, said Rourke. Oh, yes, I forgot. You forgot? Yes. There was a note of wonder in his voice, astonished by her astonishment. So there's a little more dialogue uh, in the scene, but that is is, is really the core of it to me. So first of all, I just have to say I love... As, as somebody who works on writing, which has some parallels, including outlines, have a lot of probably parallels to, uh, you know, to blueprints or to architectural drawings, I totally relate to this feeling of something bothering me and then I look at it with, I forget her, her exact terminology, but uh, it's that, let's see... Oh, glancing at it unprepared, so that that just like looking at it fresh. Sometimes I'll describe this as having altitude and seeing something and thinking, "Oh my gosh, this is so exciting! Now I can make it, it. I can make it better." But it's it's better by my own standards, and it's better. Oh, I love I love figuring out this kind of thing. So I love this this motivation that Rourke has. And so you just think about it. in his life, this is he is living right now. He is he is living because he is he's doing what he wants to do. He is he's figuring out how to build the kind of buildings that he wants to build. And he's making progress in his thinking. He's making progress with this particular building. And so in his mind, what could be less important than the dean of this institution that really has nothing to offer him that, oh, well, the dean wanted to talk to him for some reason after he had already been expelled and he doesn't want to be there anymore. Like that's something where, yeah, maybe you know, it's, it's certain he feels like, okay, well, I'll do it as a courtesy to see him, but it's just, it's not on his mind in the face of nothing could be more compelling to Rourke than a new insight about a building that he's thinking about. Whereas to Mrs. Keating, Rourke is, that's not Rourke, that world of Rourke's makes no sense. The world in which figuring out something about a building is important. Like that's, that's not what matters. It's It's not what you know or what you do. It's, it's who you know. So her view is, well, the dean, this elevated figure in the world, wanted to talk to Rourke, and how could he forget? So, 
oh yes, I forgot, you forgot. So she's astonished and he is astonished by her astonishment. I'll just finish up the scene so you get a final sense of it. She, she continues, or, or she says next, well, all I can say she choked is that it serves you right. It just serves you right. And with the commencement beginning at 4.30, how do you expect him to have time to see you? Rourke, Rourke responds, I'll go at once, Mrs. Keating. It was not her curiosity alone that prompted her to action. It was a secret fear that the sentence of the board might be revoked. He went to the bathroom at the end of the hall. She watched him washing his hands, throwing his loose straight hair back into a semblance of order. He came out again. He was on his way to the stairs before she realized that he was leaving. Mr. Rourke, she gasped, pointing at his clothes. You're not going like this. Why not? He responds. But it's your dean. Not anymore, Mrs. Keating. She thought aghast that he said it as if he were actually happy. So from Rourke's perspective, he is happy. I can imagine that it, it, it makes him happy to think, oh yeah, I no longer have to be concerned about this person at all. I, he had decided as part, you know, as, as part of a package deal that he would deal with people like the dean that he didn't believe understood architecture or could help him because there were certain people at the institution he could. But now he's decided, and the institute, institute has decided too, that there's not a place for him there. So he's probably happy to just be off on his own. Whereas for Mrs. Keating... Again, it's the way she sees the world is just different people with status. And the, and what it means to live is to increase or maintain your status in those people's lives so that they give you approval, which is supposed to be a substitute for genuine self-esteem, and so that they give you resources, which is supposed to be a substitute for creating value on your own. So even just reading this in retrospect, I can see with, with the benefit of life experience, I can see, oh yeah, well, if, if Peter Keating is any kind of product of his mom, which he clearly will be, he is going to be a failure by the standard of a creator. Like No matter what happens in his life, he's not going to be satisfied. And also just even in terms of what it looks like in terms of his status in the world, he doesn't, there's, there's nothing that is going to necessarily necessarily preserve that. Remember what Steve Jobs said about just people's opinions ebb and flow. So if Peter Keating is considered brilliant by this particular approach to architecture that has no merit to it, well, if it has no merit to it, how can anyone count on it it staying around? So it's, it's not even a secure thing to pursue status on its own. Whereas for Rourke, you have the sense of, well, whatever Rourke is doing, He's creating value and he's getting better at creating value and he's going to be satisfied with what he's doing throughout his life and whatever status he has, he's going to be satisfied and it's never going to matter to him all that much what kind of status he has, but it is going to matter to him that he's doing his work his way. So I just I just find this incredibly motivating and I, I was proud when I was, was listening to the book that how much progress I've made in these respects in terms of my own motivation, but also I found a lot of ways in which I can tap into that motivation and have that motivation more consistently. And that's that's the very, very exciting thing to me. So if you have not read The Fountainhead, highly recommend reading it for many reasons, but but particularly this this issue of motivation and the nature of different kinds of motivation, the first-handed versus the second-handed motivation or the creator's motivation versus the second-hander's motivation. That's just a, a crucial thing for, for just for life and for thinking about human flourishing. One more perspective on this is that it's essential to look at life in a long, if we're talking about flourishing, in a long-range way. And part of that means looking at life as a process as I mean it's really it's kind of a process and then it has a lot of interrelated sub processes when we're examining ways that we want that, that we might live our lives an essential question is and this, this came up on, a, on an episode a long time ago what are the implications of the process that I'm engaged in it's not enough at all to say at the moment I'm finding this satisfying because it's very easy 
for any given time to say, okay, well, I'm going to focus on this and I'm going to do this because this is going to make me a big shot. And that, that can have a certain feeling to it. It can have motivation to it and there can be approval associated with it. And it can feel like for a certain amount of time that can be sustained. It might not be the most enjoyable thing ever, but it's, it has a certain kind of enjoyment to it. But if you look at that as a process over life that I'm going to pursue status, that I'm going to try to, as my primary goal, elevate my standing in the minds of others and to get resources uh, based on the approval of others, not my own creation by my own standards that then others will recognize. But I just, I'm just primarily focused on them intellectually, psychologically, materially, that process is going to be a disaster. And I think this is, this is thinking through the implications of things is, is really, really valuable. So with any idea that somebody tells you, and if they say like, oh, you should just live for others or whatever they're saying, think about what does this really mean as a process and how will this really play out in a life? And I, and I believe that the the process of being a creator is a process that just keeps getting better and better and that has a growing sense of satisfaction. And to the extent that there are elements of second-handedness and living through others, that's something that just becomes hollow and insecure. And there's so much when people are living that way, which is unfortunately the way we're taught to live as a virtue, when people are living secondhand, there's so much desperation for validation. So they want to tell you, oh yeah, well, this is this is really, I am really satisfied with my status and like looking for other people who are doing it and they must be satisfied. But there's this kind of fear of, oh yeah, well, it's like something, something's wrong about this. We're not really happy. We're not really satisfied. And that's why I said that I think that this this book really has so much of the secret to life of of being a creator. And because when I look at my own life and what I'm happiest about, it's very connected to when I've been a creator by my own standards, doing what I, what I, the kinds of work that I love to do. And when I look at other people that I, I look at and I think, wow, th- that person really, that person's really happy with their life. Almost in, invariably, there's this very strong creator element. And when it's somebody that seems successful but isn't really happy, with their lives and they're kind of trying to convince themselves that they're happy or others are happy. There's just second handedness all over the place. So that is a big part of the wisdom of the fountainhead. Hope that you enjoyed that discussion. I, I would love any kind of feedback you have, particularly on our Facebook page, including whether you're interested in any more discussion of the book. I'm pretty sure I'll do at least one more discussion of it. So if you want to listen to that, make sure to read chapters one through five since I'll, I'll discuss material in that. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Again, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash human flourishing project. Actually, I forget if I mentioned that or not, but facebook.com slash human flourishing project. And the website, if you want to get weekly email updates every time there's a new show, is humanflourishingproject.com. I'll be back next week, probably talking about the wisdom of the fountainhead again. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been the Human Flourishing Project.